particularly. And I wanted to start by with a little story of my first experience with Black LA, um, which was about 10 years ago when I went on a West Coast excursion with my grandfather. And we met up with his friend from high school in Inglewood. And they'd both grown up in Central Florida and then left with hundreds of thousands of other African Americans during the Great Migration. My grandfather to Newark, New Jersey, and his friend Charles to Los Angeles. So we get to Charles's house and we tell him about all the touristy things we'd done the day before, and he just shakes his head in disappointment and says, Get in the car. We're going on a tour of Black LA, the real Black LA. And so we proceeded to go on a three hour driving tour of Black LA. And he tells us all these stories. And I don't remember much of it because I was very hungry and I just wanted to go to Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles. But one thing that I do remember is Charles repeatedly saying things like, this used to be a nightclub, but it's not anymore. Or, this used to be a, a black owned <laughs> store, but it, it's, it closed down many years back. And so my first perception of Black LA during this experience uh, was shaped by his narrative of this kind of golden age of black development and black commerce and black ownership, and then a subsequent decline. And I think Charles's narrative reflects the dreams and realities that you suggest in your, the title of your most recent book. So moving on to talk a little bit about that, you edited uh, the book, Black Los Angeles, American Dreams and Racial Realities. What was the dream that drew black folks to LA and what were the realities that they encountered? Well, first of all, I wanna say, um, it's really great to be here and I appreciate the, uh, the invitation. And uh, welcome to LA, Daniel. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> hopefully, uh, you know, when COVID is behind us, so you'll have a chance to actually be here physically and, and, and you know, I guess to reacquaint yourself with some of the things you experienced 10 years ago when you were taking that tour with your grandfather. Um, so Black Los Angeles American Dreams and Racial Realities was really about a 10 year project. When I was director of the, the Ralph J. Bunn Center for African American Studies, um, which is like a think tank at UCLA, it's been around since 1969. Uh, its mission is to study the life, culture, and sort of well-being of, of, of people of African descent. Uh, with a special emphasis on California and Los Angeles, but we also look at Black people throughout the diaspora um, at the Bunch Center. Um, we realized that there had never really been um, a comprehensive look at Black Los Angeles thinking about those particular topics, culture, um, you know, politics, well-being, um, home ownership, just a range of different topics. Yes, there have been lots of books on Los Angeles about black people in LA, but none that really tried to pull it all together and connect the dots between the past, the present, and the future. And that's what we were trying to do with the book. So what we did was we assembled an all-star team of scholars. Some were historians, some were sociologists, some were anthropologists, some were African-Americanists, some were um, cultural studies people to begin a dialogue. And we spent about three years literally just having conversations with each other. We had a series of workshops that focused on different themes um, like space and sort of how black people are distributed spatially in LA, uh, culture, um, um, identity, um, you know, different types of understanding yourself as a black person in the world. And we had a series of conversations in all those conversations, we, you know, started with the universe of possibilities of, you know, if you're going to do a book like this, how many chapters would you have and what things have to be in the book? And we came up with a list of about 100 potential uh, chapters and we whittled it down to the 15 or 16 or so that made it in the book. And the goal of the book was not just to have a series of standalone chapters that didn't speak to one another, but to literally have the scholars in conversations with one another. So as they were drafting these original chapters, um, we as editors could try to stitch it together and, and hopefully tell a bigger story. But that was the goal. And we always saw the project as the first step in a much bigger project because we realized we couldn't do everything in one volume and we figured we'd do a follow-up volume at some point. We haven't done it yet, but anyway, that was the plan. So I think the dream and where the, the title comes from, American um, uh, Racial Realities, uh, American Dreams and Racial Realities, um, comes from an acknowledgement of the long history of racial oppression in America, particularly um, you know, 
Black people have faced since 1619 when the first Africans came to Jamestown um, to the present and you know, projecting forward into the future. And as the recent protests show us, um, a lot of these issues to this day are quite salient and, and prominent in American society. The dream was um, the notion of California, what California meant. Um, many people don't know this, but California gets its name from a mythical Amazonian black warrior queen um, named Polyphia. And that's where California is named. And it was, it was the subject of a, a, a 1500, a, a sort of a book, a, a novel written in the 1500s, early 1500s by a, a Spanish poet that sort of imagined the Isle of California that was ruled by this, this, this you know, African descendant woman. And so, you know, it's kind of interesting that California has its early its roots in African culture and, and African myth. Um, the other thing that was um, quite striking about, about LA in particular was that when LA was founded in 1781 by Mexican um, settlers, um, more than half of them had African blood. A lot of people don't know that. Um, in fact, we, um, uh, we have a chapter in the book that traces through various censuses, the, the various people who were involved in the settling of LA. And of the original um, 46 settlers, 26 uh, were African descended. Um, the first mayor of Los Angeles, Francisco Reyes, was of African descent, you know, before Tom Bradley. So this is huge and interesting African history in LA um, that, you know, creates this, um, this, this, this vision of what might be possible here. Now, if you think about the history of, of California as a place, of course, at this point, um, it was all part of Mexico. And the Mexican-American War, um, which I guess concluded in 1846, resulted in all this land being seized from Mexico and becoming a part of the United States, which included California, Texas, etc. California becomes a state in 1850. And unlike other states in the union when, you know, um, a lot of this was, was um, you know, sort of being um, the, the issue of race and slavery in particular uh, was being debated and contested. California entered the union as a free state, meaning that it did not officially sanction slavery. Now, the reality was a lot of Southerners moved to California once it became a state and they brought their slaves with them, sort of in violation of what California was supposed to be. So at least in the early days, there was this notion of uh, California as this land of opportunity. Um, you know, the gold rush brought people here. There were all these settlers who came to LA in the 1880s with the, the, um, uh, uh, the creation of the, the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, USC, for example, was, was founded in 1880, right as you know, settlers from the Midwest were coming to LA and the population was growing exponentially. And it was kind of seen as this wide open place where you know, Jim Crow, which was, you know, um, you know, sort of certainly after the end of slavery in the, in the late 1880s, uh, Jim Crow was, was sort of, um, um, I, I guess, coming into dominance and sort of determining the life chances of people of African descent and put in place to, to keep back black people in their place. California was imagined as this place where Jim Crow really didn't matter in quite the same way. A lot of it had to do with demographics in the sense that the black population ironically, it was relatively small at this point, even though it started out as a predominantly African descended place. By that time, because of the influx of white settlers from um, the Midwest, the black share of the population was relatively small. So it wasn't really seen as much of a threat. And after all, it was a free state. So W.E.B. Du Bois, the famous black historian sociologist, comes to California in 1913 um, shortly after the NAACP, the Niagara Movement, the NAACP had been created. He was, of course, one of the founders of the NAACP. And he um, writes this remarkable piece in the Crisis Magazine where he talks about California. Uh, the piece was called Colored California. And he talks about California as this uh, mecca for Black people, basically. Because he's looking at the Black people who live in LA, in particular, who had these amazing houses, these craftsmen, you know, turn of the century places that are much larger by comparison to anything you would see other black people having throughout the rest of the country but that was in the throes of Jim Crow. Uh, and, 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 and really kind of um, it, almost like Califia and the myth of Califia describes it as this place that uh, where black people can get ahead. He talks about um, how enterprising the black people are here in LA, how 
They aren't afraid to go into the department stores and, you know, things that you would not do in, in the segregated South where there was a white, a white store and a, and a black store, white fountain, black fountain, black, you know, uh, bathrooms, white bathrooms, that type of thing. And um, undoubtedly created this image, you know, along with other stories that circulated out of California, that LA was this place where black people could get ahead. And so the book kind of opens with that history to kind of lay out what California and LA in particular has meant over the years in the popular imagination for black people and how that dream um, quickly came into um, uh, sort of conflict with the reality, you know, as Jim Crow essentially follows black people to LA. And, and Danielle, you mentioned the great migration and, and, and there was a huge influx of black people into LA in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. I mean, the black population really explodes. Uh, to the point by the 1980s, um, LA County had the second largest black population in the country. And a lot of people didn't know this, um, about a million people. And the only county in America with a larger black population is Cook County, which is where Chicago is located. Um, so LA, of course, because it's so large and black people have been a relatively small share of this incredibly large place, it wasn't typically talk, talked about as a black space. And so that was another thing we wanted to examine in the book was to really excavate that history and try to understand, you know, how LA is imagined. And, and you know, I could go on, but, you know, my area of expertise is race and media. And so, of course, Hollywood is here. And a lot of the way we think about LA and black LA is a reflection of what we've seen in Hollywood productions over the years. Mm -hmm. So let me just get back to your original question. So, so I, I think the dream was sort of the idea of California as this free space that was open, that wasn't encumbered by a lot of the constraints that the rest, the rest of America was dealing with, uh, with respect to black people and Jim Crow. And the realities are the fact that, you know, race in America matters. And even in California, even in LA, given, or rather despite some of the ways in which it was distinct from the rest of the country, um, race becomes more and more salient in LA over time as the black population grows and is um, perceived to be a threat to the white status quo. Hmm. Yeah, well, I learned a lot just from that response. Um, and I also see a lot, of, a lot of similarities with the city I study, Atlanta, uh, particularly in kind of the, the role of the a mythos, um, an idea of Atlanta at least being kind of a modern black Mecca I had never really thought about Los Angeles as kind of a, a, an older idea of a black Mecca. Um, yeah. So that's really fascinating, um, thinking about all the ways in which Atlanta and um, Los Angeles are kind of very similar, but also very different. Um, but another thing I wanted to ask you about, um, what I think the LA riots of 92 have been on a lot of people's minds um, sure. recently. Um, and I think um, the riots in 92 and then even going back farther to the, to the Watts riots or uprisings, whatever we want to call them, in, in 65, mm -hmm. I think those really bring into stark relief the kind of the realities of, of racial injustice that, as you mentioned, followed Black people wherever they went. So for anyone who doesn't really know uh, what happened, can you give us a quick overview of what happened in 92 with Rodney King and kind of how that led to the riots. Sure, sure. Um, well, you really have to go back to, well, Watts and before. I mean, yeah. to, to really put it in context. Um, I mean, even back to the Zoot Suit riots in the 1940s, you know, uh, where you had the targeting of Latinos and, and, and you know, African-Americans um, who wore those suit suits. And it was really an attempt to keep people in their place racially. Um, so again, as the LA population grew exponentially throughout the 20th century to the point where we're now the number two city in the country, only behind New York, um, the diversity of the city grew. And you know, in a city that was rooted in Midwest Anglo culture, suddenly found itself in conflict with all of these diverse groups. And of course, you know, fast forwarding to the 70s and 80s, you know, immigration becomes a huge part of it. The Latino population explodes. And, you know, I'll put a pin in it for now, but we can get into some of the ways in which the power structure responded to those demographics to try to contain 
diversity to, to contain blackness and, and brownness in, in LA during that period. But so all of this is happening in terms of demographics. You have the black population growing and the police, and this is what the debate today is about in terms of the protests we've seen across the country about policing and defunding policing and, and what the real function of policing is. Um, policing actually started in this country with slave patrols. Um, you know, uh, attempts to sort of find runaway slaves and to, um, with bounty hunters and to bring them back in the whole bit. And, that, and that's sort of the, um, um, sort of the, um, uh, the originating um, sort of um, uh, um, institution, I guess, in American society that leads to modern policing. And many critics of policing over the years have argued that a lot of that function um, continues within modern policing. It's about surveillance, it's about surveilling communities of color. Um, it's about racial profiling. And that's been a huge debate, you know, stop and frisk, you know, all these different tactics that have been used around the country to disproportionately surveil communities of color, um, to disproportionately incarcerate them. We all know, we've heard, I'm sure, about, you know, sort of the, the, um, the prison industrial complex and the degree to which you know, African Americans and to a lesser degree Latinos are overrepresented among prison inmates. A lot of that's due to three strikes laws, to um, the war on drugs, but a lot of it has to do with the hyper surveillance of communities of color. And, and that of course implicates the police. And so the, um, um, the old cliche of, you know, protect and serve for police, well, that's the, the jargon, I suppose. But, you know, whereas the white community and um, uh, sort of dominant communities may see the police as protectors and, and servants, um, many communities of color, um, uh, you know, see the police as, um, as, uh, as, as threats, you know, and they fear the police. So with that backdrop, um, we have Marquette Fry, who's this um, black motorist who's um, driving through South LA. Um, and the report was that he was driving haphazardly, he's pulled over by the police. Um, you know, a crowd forms around, um, there are these, um, uh, allegations that of the police had previously roughed up a pregnant black woman, that they were disrespecting Mar Marquette Fry, his mother was there, and the crowd got more and more belligerent until there was an outbreak of violence that eventually exploded into what we call the Watts riots, not put that in quotation marks. Um, it was a, a pretty deadly affair, and um, at that point, of course, it was um, probably the, the biggest or at least the most significant urban uprising, you know, involving, you know, people of color up until that point. Now, what's interesting is that earlier racial quote unquote riots in this country typically involve white people destroying black communities like Tulsa, for example, the Tulsa riots where so-called black Wall Street was, was, was destroyed. Because again, you know, um, the feeling among white super in control and advocates of white supremacy was that black people were getting, you know, too uppity and that they had to be put in their place and we're gonna burn this community down, which is what happened. So the tables were turned in, in a way during the 1960s, which sociologists refer to as the great transformation when there was this rise in um, movements involving collectivities of various sorts. There was kind of the, I guess the, the apex of the modern civil rights movement. There was the Chicano movement, the gay and lesbian movement, the second women's movement. I mean, all these movements that happened in the 60s that were rooted in this notion of group-based rights, which was somewhat different than the way America had traditionally thought about rights as individual, you know? Even though, of course, if we go back to the Constitution, we realized that groups were in fact implicated because it was white male property owners who had all the rights for the most part. Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, getting into the 1960s, um, um, in 1965, you had the situation that was ripe for, for an uprising because there had been a lot of um, discontent in black and brown communities about, you know, um, kind of the brutality of policing. Um, and of course, once uh, what's happened, you know, the city, um, large parts of the city were burned. Um, there were many deaths. And um, many historians kind of refer to that as a turning point in the civil rights movement, kind of a transition from the modern civil rights movement that was rooted in nonviolent direct action philosophy to what might be called broadly the black power movement, you know, where blacks felt that they had to more aggressively confront the power structure in order to create the type of change we wanted to see. 
So over the years from the 1960s all the way through the 1970s, and by the way, out of the 1960s came a number of, of, of changes that um, were meant to um, address some of the racial inequalities in America. Um, we had affirmative action, for example, as a, as a, as a policy um, that was implemented you know, under a Republican president, Nixon, actually, in the, in the late 1960s. Uh, in the 1970s, there was a backlash of sorts where, where whites felt like things had gone too far in the 1960s, and you started to see a rise of anti uh, sort of black sentiment among whites. It really culminates in the, in the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, you know, which people have referred to as the Reagan Revolution. And it was sort of a repudiation of a lot of the civil rights reforms that came out of the 1960s. I'm giving you this really brief overview here to kind of set the stage for what was happening between 1965 and 1992. Um, during this period, of course, the LAPD kept being the LAPD. The LAPD had been glamorized in shows like Dragnet. Um, it, it sort of um, embraced the notion of using paramilitary tactics in its policing. It sort of innovated the use of helicopters, you know, to surveil neighborhoods, the battering ram. There were all these different innovations, um, uh, military um, equipment that the LAPD used and introduced to modern policing, basically. And you had a series of police chiefs in LA who were notorious, and many of them um, uh, deemed to be racist. Um, uh, chief Parker, who Parker Center was named after, um, was quite notorious as a police chief. Uh, Daryl Gates, who was the police chief during 1992, uh, during the uprisings, was known to say things like, you know, as blacks were disproportionately dying um, in chokeholds when they were pulled over, he said things like, well, you know, the veins of, of black people don't open up like, quote, normal people. In other words, things like that. And so all of this was commonly said publicly in the open, you know. And so needless to say, black communities um, were very distrustful of the police and fearful of the police. Um, so that sets the stage for 1991. It was March 3rd, 1991. Rodney King was um, driving down the highway um, in sort of, um, uh, I, forget the, um, I forget the name of the, the area, but it was sort of like Northern LA County, uh, California Highway Patrol, and pulls them over. Um, two officers from Cal California Highway Patrol, they um, radio went in, they're joined by several other officers from the LAPD. And what started as a routine traffic stop becomes this brutal beating. I mean, he's, he's beat 54 times uh, with baton blows. His skull is cracked. One of his eyes is nearly uh, put out. Um, he suffered permanent brain damage. Um, and um, he was tasered multiple times. Um, and all of this was captured on videotape. And that's what was unique about it. Um, a guy just happened to be looking out of his apartment window, George Holliday, had a camcorder. And camcorder technology was relatively new in 1991. Um, and um, he recorded the whole thing from a distance. Uh, the video was shared with, um, I believe it was um, KTLA TV here in local news station. And it was hypermediated around the world. It immediately just went viral, you know, before we, we even talk about social media, it went everywhere. And anyone who's alive at that point saw that video at some point and saw it multiple times. And the assumption, of course, was that, wow, this was brutal. I mean, we had no idea that police would do this. This guy, you know, there's seven officers just beating this guy nearly to death, you know, and it went on for a long time. And surely they're going to be found guilty uh, of something. I can't believe this is happening. Meanwhile, people in the black community were saying, well, this happens all the time. We've been saying this for decades, uh, but we didn't have video proof. And it was our word against the police. And when this thing goes to a judge or if it goes to trial, of course the jury is going to believe the police because typically the jury is largely white. And remember, white people see police as protecting and serving. You know, and black people, of course, see police as, as, um, as fear and threat. So when it finally does go to trial, um, they move the trial to Simi Valley, which is a suburb of LA in LA County. They move it from downtown LA where it probably would have been because. According to prosecutors, there, well, not prosecutors, but to the defense, there was a concern that they couldn't get a fair jury because of the publicity around the case. And they moved, wanted to move it someplace else where they felt they could get a fair trial. Well, of course, moving it to Simi Valley, which was a large white suburban enclave um, of LA, um, where many police officers lived who actually worked in LA, um, they got a very sympathetic jury that you know, tended to side with the police and the jury was virtually all white. 
And after the defense attorneys were able to convince the jury that Rodney King was actually the aggressor, that it was Rodney King, they would stop the video and do it frame by frame and see he stood up there as opposed to just laying down. They eventually convinced the jury that it was Rodney King's fault, that the police were just doing what they should have done because some of them were fearful of what he might do to them. Because Rodney King was a pretty big guy. But of course, there were seven officers on the scene. And so they were sort of tapping into this trope of black threat, and particularly the, the threat of the black male body, um, to make the argument that the police were um, uh, right in, in what they did in this particular instance. And, and the verdict basically was um, uh, exonerated, for the most part, the police officers. I was in LA when that happened. Um, I was a graduate student. I was actually working on my PhD, or about to start working on my PhD. And I knew that it was going to deal with race and media, but I didn't know exactly what the topic was going to be. But um, as time wore on, I saw that this was my topic, you know, because I had data from kind of before, during, and after to do some quasi-experimental stuff on public opinion about, um, about the, the uprisings. Um, when news of the verdicts um, came out that day, and I think it was about one o'clock in the afternoon, um, the flashpoint of events was um, supposedly Florence and Normandy, which is in South LA. Um, and, you know, as time went on, there were video images of people going to Parker Center and protesting and pulling over police kiosks, flipping police cars, setting buildings on fire. And the, um, the uprisings went on for, for several evenings. Um, it was the costliest um, urban uprising to date in 1992 when it happened. I believe there were, um, there were more than 50 deaths. Um, there were about 12,000 arrests. Um, many people of Latino um, heritage were rounded up, some of them um, um, sort of um, sent to Mexico, even though some of them were citizens. I mean, there was just a lot going on that, that um, complicated what happened during this event. But it, it really did um, sort of um, mark kind of the breakdown and legitimacy of um, sort of policing in LA, um, the criminal justice system, and um, was a, I guess, a reflection of the lack of trust and faith that um, black and brown communities in particular had in authorities in LA. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned that, like, that one of the more notable things about that incident was that it was recorded and circulated widely. It went viral. And now we've kind of had decades of yep. images of police assaulting or in many cases murdering black people go viral um the most recent one being uh the murder of, of george floyd do you think that we that this moment is a tipping point um or is it just another iteration of what has been you know not decades of of highly visible black death. Is there something distinct about this moment that might make it uh, so that it's not just a, another example? So, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, of course, but of course. Um, I can look at patterns and um, it's what sociologists do. We try to look at patterns and figure out, um, you know, what, has happened, what the likely causes of what has happened are, and what does that portend for the future? And that's what we, in a nutshell, do. And one of the things that's quite obvious to me is that um, where California was in 1992, uh, the rest of America is right now. And you know, so in many ways, you can think of California as a racial bellwether for the rest of the country. Why? Because in, you know, with the possible exception of Hawaii, uh, California is the most diverse state in the union. Um, it doesn't have a racial minority, any majority. Um, uh, whites currently, um, I think, are about 36%, non Hispanic whites, about 36% of the California population, Hispanics, about 39%, and Blacks, about, um, I think, about um, 6% of, of the population here in the state. So it's incredibly diverse. Um, we were going through the throes of demographic transition in 1992. And I think 1992 and the things that happened immediately after 1992, and there were reforms that came out of 1992, just like people are advocating for reforms today coming out of the, the 
the recent George Floyd protests. Um, the LAPD was essentially, dis well, it wasn't dismantled, but it was overhauled. Uh, Daryl Gates was kicked out as police chief. They brought in um, the LAPD's first black police chief, uh, Willie Williams from, I think he came from Philadelphia. Um, they tried to implement community policing. Um, they raised the profile of the, of the, um, the, the, the police oversight board. Um, they, um, it became part of um, uh, sort of a justice department investigation where they looked at the pattern and practice of activity within the LAPD. And out of that, um, lots of longstanding policies were changed. And the LAPD is far from perfect as Black Lives Matter movement would, would argue. Um, but it, I would argue it's light years ahead of where it was in 1992. And in fact, public opinion suggests that there's a lot more faith in the LAPD today, even in black and brown communities than there was in 1992. Now, again, that said, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, you know, mm -hmm. far from, you know, sort of re resolve the problems. So the, I guess, good news story of California and the fact that we've in many ways learned to more or less get along in a very, very diverse state the rest of America is dealing with that right now because demographically the same things that happened to California in the 1990s are now happening to the rest of the country. I mean, currently people of color make up about 40% of the U.S. population. And that share is growing by about a half a percent per year to the point by 2040 or 2043, the U.S. is going to be a majority minority country. And that's what all the racial strife in America is about right now. It's about white supremacy trying to hold on in a country that's changing demographically. This is why an effort is constantly being made to pack the courts with young judges who will be around for 30 or 40 years to um, implement policies and to <clears throat> make judgments <coughs> that protect white supremacy and, and certain types of structural racism. This is why um, certain appeals can be made to the electorate that seem almost unimaginable in 2020, but people are reluctant to give up their privilege and they're very susceptible to fear mongering and to the idea that these people of color are threats. And, and, and so it's a very potent um, set of narratives that I think are animating the racial position that we're in right now. So I think that um, if California is any um, indication that there will be reforms, there will be meaningful reforms that come out of the George Floyd protests, but it's not gonna change things overnight. Uh, in California, you know, in 1992, um, you know, after the uprisings, as I said, there were a number of reforms made to the LAPD that ultimately in the three decades since have made LA, I think, a better place. <clears throat> but shortly after that, there was a backlash. Mm -hmm. And in 1996, um, California voters went to the polls, uh, I should say white voters for the most part, went to the polls, and um, enacted California Proposition 209, which did away with affirmative action in the state of California. And again, it was an attempt to um, hold people of color at bay and to preserve white privilege in certain types of institutions. And, and Prop 209 applied to, to public institutions. And so I'm at UCLA, a, a public university, and we've been under um, kind of the jurisdiction of Prop 209 since it went into effect in 1997. Um, which means that it's been really, really hard to diversify our student body, hard to diversify our faculty, because all kinds of legal scrutiny uh, um, uh, was put in place that limited the types of tools we have to actually search for what we call inclusive excellence, you know, the best candidates who also happen to be diverse. It becomes really, really hard under the way to Prop 209. Um, from my view, um, the good news is it looks like Prop 209 is going to be on the ballot in November. And that demographically, I think we're in a position now uh, to, to reverse it because California has moved far beyond where it was in 1996. So I say all that to say, I think something similar will happen in America. I mean, I think the presidential election this fall is going to be a referendum on not just the current president, but on um, George Floyd and the protests and all these things, because in many ways, they're all interconnected. COVID-19, uh, which has a racial impact. It disproportionately affects um, you know, African-Americans and Latinos. Um, in LA, actually Latinos more than African-Americans. Um, because of structural racism, um, the fact that African-Americans and Latinos tend to be relegated in so-called essential 
jobs that put them on the front line at risk of infection. Whereas people who have white color jobs who can work from home and do Zoom meetings like we're doing today can protect themselves. Or they have better health care than, you know, if they do get infected, they're more likely to survive because they have better health care. So all these things are um, uh, reflections of the underlying racial structure that play out in real time in, in people's lives. So I think that um, it's going to be a few years, but I think there will be some reforms. And as, as the U.S. becomes more demographically diverse, um, which is inevitable, um, I think it'll start looking more like California in terms of its politics. It, it may take a few years before we get there. Okay, well, hopefully that is some hopeful news for everyone that's listening. Um, I wanna ask just one more question before I open it up to folks in the audience um, and kind of shifting to your research on uh, media and diversity. There's been a lot of discussions about diversity in media, particularly in film and television, kind of both in front of and behind the camera, and specifically about the need for more um, representation. Why do you think representation matters? Well, you know, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> in five minutes. So, um, so one of my one of my intellectual mentors is the great Stuart Hall, um, sociologist um, out of the UK. Um, he was one of the founders of cultural studies, British cultural studies, which is a an approach that um, attempted to sort of meld the work of the social sciences, particularly anthropology and sociology, with critical work coming out of the humanities. Um, 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 all focused on media, media studies and the role that media play in popular culture and how that relates to politics, be it class politics, which are really significant in the UK, but also racial politics and gender politics. Um, and so um, a lot of that similar work that came out of the late 1960s into the 1970s greatly influenced the way um, I think about the work I do with respect to race and media. And so my dissertation um, on the LA uprisings became my first book um, that was actually published in the UK. It was Cambridge University Press that published it. And, and I kind of um, got some great feedback from some of those original, you know, Brit uh, British cultural studies folks who were helping me kind of think through um, the methodology that I uh, use in the work I do. So representation matters because representation is um, essentially what we're talking about is those irresistible taken for granted images that we, that are, that are so commonplace in our experience that we don't critically examine them. We just sort of um, see them as a window onto the world. So I'm thinking about things like man, woman, black, white, these terms immediately conjure in our minds certain images and they tend to be standardized within a culture. And um, there's some variations, but more or less standardized within a culture and associated with those images are what Stuart Hall has referred to as chains of equivalence. Um, so just to kind of give you an example, um, if you think of the term black, you may conjure up an image of what you think of as a prototypical black person. Um, Stuart Hall would argue that, you know, one chain of equivalence that might be associated with that is something like African, um, um, slave, inferior, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look up white, which is sort of like the binary opposite of black, you'd have free, superior, et cetera, et cetera. So the basic idea that, that Stuart Hall argues that I think goes to the core of why representation matters is that meaning is relational. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. The way we understand the meaning of something is always in relation to something else, which is why you know, the binary opposites of white and black are so powerful within the racial space. Um, you know, race doesn't exist in sort of a, um, a, a physical sense. I mean, you know, race is a social construction, we would argue in sociology. And it's a creation that, that does political work, it does cultural work, um, and it's meant to shape the way people relate to one another. So we have something that Stuart Hall and his colleagues refer to as the circuit of culture, where you have representation at the very top, and then you have a series of other concepts like identity, uh, production, consumption, and regulation that are all cultural processes that are influenced and shaped by representation, by those images. And more importantly, 
all of the things like identity, who we are, who we aren't, who we hope to be, um, are also influenced by things like regulation, you know, how the boundaries are drawn between different racial groups or gender groups. Um, you know, this whole debate over LGBTQ status, for example, and, and sort of trans status, you know, if, if, you're, if your representation is a man woman and nothing else can exist, then that's going to affect the way you think about the notion of trans and so forth and so on. And all these things are bound up in representations and these images that are a part of our culture that have the potential to change over time, you know, through those other moments in the circuit, like regula regulation, identity, production, what the society literally produces, and here Hollywood is implicated, what it's producing in terms of those stories and images, and what we consume, consumption. You know, advertising plays a huge uh, role in this process. One of the reasons why advertising repeats the same advertisements over and over again is it's serving us certain representations that they're hoping we'll identify with, so we'll go out and purchase buy them. So one of the things I talk about when I talk about Hollywood diversity is that it's more than just entertainment. Truly, yes, it is entertainment, it is entertaining, but it's also doing all this other cultural work beneath the surface uh, that's, that's wound up in the representations. And sometimes, you know, if you have people who are committed to an anti-racist politics, they're being very intentional about what they're trying to do with representation. Other times, people are very uncritical and not at all reflexive and are just sort of trafficking in stereotypes and, and sort of things that they take for granted and in the process reproducing stereotypes in certain ways of seeing other groups that reproduce the status quo. And so what we do when we study media is we try to unpack that process and what type of political work is being done. And one of the reasons we do the Hollywood Diversity Report at UCLA is we're trying to track over time how inclusive the industry is becoming and what that's likely to mean for the types of narratives that it would circulate. Okay. I have a, many more questions about that. <laughs> but we, we should probably move on to some of the questions that have come in. Kathleen, would it be better if I read the questions or if I call on the person that asked the question for them? I think to ask you can them. go ahead and just read them out. Okay. So we have a question from Alistair. Um, I don't, sorry, I don't know if you wanted to remain anonymous. It's not from Alistair. Well, okay. The, uh, these are good questions, so you should want your name to be attached to them. You, you have a number of questions, but I'm only gonna ask the first one. Um, they say, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on how various police shows have shaped opinion on the police and racialized policing, especially if you have thoughts on recent shows like Live PD? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I did a study um, <clears throat> a couple of years ago for Color of Change, the advocacy group. I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but they're very interested in the role that Hollywood plays in racial politics. And they asked me to do a study of writers' rooms in TV and um, how the dynamics of the writers' room um, impacts the types of stories that are told. And they were particularly interested in um, the depiction of black communities uh, and the relationship between how black communities are depicted and the dynamics of writers' rooms. And one of the issues they, they foregrounded for me was this issue of the criminal justice system. And they wanted to look at crime procedurals, cop shows, to see what type of ideological work those shows might be doing. So the first thing we found was that um, black writers and writers of color in general are woefully underrepresented um, in writers' rooms overall, but they're even more underrepresented in crime procedurals. That is to say, when writers are sitting around the table and they often sit around the table for 12 to 14 hours a day to kind of negotiate characters and stories and how those various episodes can be written, you almost never had a black voice at the table. So police were being presented in ways that didn't incorporate the types of black experiences that we were talking about earlier that shaped the way black communities in LA think about the LAPD, for example. So what you tend to get from cop shows, going back to Dragnet, that kind of glorified the LAPD as the, the pinnacle of policing, is um, the protect and serve model of policing, that the criminal justice system is basically legitimate, the criminals are bad, and the cops are good. Uh, which, of course, resonates with juries um, that are largely white who see the police as their protectors and their servants 
and are very loath to render verdicts that, you know, side with a victim of the police um, uh, over the police. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of, I think, you know, one of the arguments we made in that report was that in order to break out of this cycle whereby we give a very slanted one side view of policing and the role of police, um, it would be important to diversify the writer's rooms of shows that are based on policing um, such that you have people from communities who have negative experiences with police, police so that the storytelling is more balanced. Interesting. Yeah, I think a lot about that. And I had a student last or two quarters ago that wrote a paper on kind of the role of black police officers and, mm -hmm. um, and how that's, it's kind of part of, uh, a sort of reform within, within these, uh, procedural shows and the kind of work that was doing. Um, but let me go to another question because I could talk about that for another 20 minutes as well. Um, another question, do you see reforms to existing policing practices as a solution or do you see complete dismantling and restructuring of the current system as the solution? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, so, you know, I tend to be, um, 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 I believe in progressive change as opposed to revolutionary, revolutionary change. I mean, I think if you look at history and the way that change occurs, I'm a Gramscian. Um, Antonio Gramsci, you know, the theorist, the Italian theorist, informs a lot of what I do. And in fact, he's one of the um, sort of the, the fathers of theory, I guess, that informed um, British cultural studies, which is the, the frame that I, I use in most of my work. And it does really argue for a more progressive, sort of cycle of change that is connected with any number of different equilibria. You know, something happens, you have a crisis, there's a response. You don't throw out the entire system, you tend to change it in a major way so that you reach a new equilibrium, a new balance where you've, you know, moved a few steps ahead, then you have another crisis, which could take you back a few steps. Then you have another crisis, maybe you move ahead a few more steps so that, you know, over a long period of time, you, you tend to see progress, usually, although it's no guarantee. And I think that model is more realistic in terms of, you know, thinking about what has happened over the years and how it's happened. So um, I don't think it's realistic that we'll see the police completely dismantled. Um, I think what will happen is any number of reforms um, and um, sort of defunding moves like, you know, LA Mayor Garcetti has proposed um, cutting, I believe, close to $200 million from the LAPD budget and redirecting that money to um, community um, programs to sort of build up communities. Because a lot of the, of the so-called crime that, that sort of warrants the move to put more and more money in policing is really the result of these underlying structural inequalities. And the fact that people don't have ample employment, people don't have opportunities for schooling, um, for transportation, for recreation, all the things that create right circumstances for increases in crime. And so the argument is rather than treat the symptoms, i.e. the crime, by giving money to police, why not treat the underlying causes and put the money into programs that make it less likely that we'll have criminal activity. That's the logic. And so I think that that's probably more likely. And there have been lots of calls for defunding the police, which is not the same as dismantling the police. I think there's sort of a, sort of like a conceptual slippage there where people think that the term defunding means that you're going to literally shut down the police department. No, I mean, for public safety, there has to be some measure of policing. I mean, crimes do occur, but it's really more about redirecting funds in ways that ultimately um, reduce the amount of crime so that policing isn't needed at the same level and also just improves the life circumstances of, of, of citizens. And so I think that that's likely to happen in places like LA and it's being debated in other places. Um, and we'll have to see, you know, how it plays out. 
in the same way that after 1992, there were reforms to the LAPD that ultimately made it a better organization, flawed, but better than it was in 1992. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, as you mentioned, it's important to kind of consider the local context of these shifts. And it seems like many of these reforms are going to be on, on a local level um, rather than a more national one. Which I yeah, think I mean, you know, the federal government, they can set certain guidelines about, um, you know, chokeholds and specific tactics, but policing is a local matter. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it's sort of the funding is determined at the local level, um, the administration is at the local level, and obviously, you know, the way these things are enacted in Mississippi are going to differ from how they're enacted in LA or San Francisco. So um, we're going to see a range of, of responses, hopefully all moving in the right direction, hopefully. Hopefully, yes. Kathleen, are we out of time or do we have time for one more question? Um, I think we can do one more and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, so the final question, in discussions with my family and friends, I've heard a lot of statements when talking about a, a variety of racial injustices, like trying to get those statues taken down takes media attention away from serious mm -hmm. issues like mass incarceration and police brutality. I find it hard to properly articulate a good response to these things, so I would love to get your take. And I, I think um, I would add to that, um, well, I could let you just answer that question, but I, but I think there, one thing I'm curious about and my, my question about representation was kind of trying to get at was this distinction between serious issues like mass incarceration or, or uh, police brutality versus issues that are seemingly less serious, whether it be representation in media or kind of whether or not these statues are, come down and these buildings are renamed. Um, so how do you kind of relate those two together um, as a broader project about, of, of racial justice? It's all connected. Um, it's all important. Um, distraction, well, the, the idea of one type of problem distracting our attention from another um, is only a concern if we lose sight of the other thing. And, and what I would argue is that it's a multi-frontal struggle that requires our attention, attention at multiple levels. It also requires a division of labor in terms of how we respond to it. I think we all have roles to play. Some, we, we all specialize in certain types of things. You know, as a, as a sociologist, I'm most comfortable, you know, talking about the particulars of race and media. I have colleagues at UCLA and elsewhere who are specialists on mass incarceration. Um, I can talk about it and I can talk about the ways in which it connects with race and media, but I'm not an expert on that. And so I, I feel that that's their role to play. Um, you have others who um, are experts on early childhood development and what certain types of images and stories um, do to the way that, you know, um, children develop a sense of self, uh, an identity, and how they ultimately relate to other people and what that's likely to mean for race relations in the future. Um, I understand that process, and I know that it connects up with the use and the consumption of media, but I'm not an expert on early childhood development, nor am I a school teacher um, who is in a frontline position to deal with those things. So I guess the point I'm making is that None of it's irrelevant in the same way that, you know, I've argued that Hollywood is not just entertainment. It is entertaining, but it's not just entertainment. So we can't give it a pass and say that, oh, we have to focus on more important things like mass incarceration, because while we do that, Hollywood's doing ideological work in the background that's working against our attempts to do the other things. So I think, I think my response would be that it's all important and that we all have a, a, a role to play and we have to do our best to try to figure out how to connect the dots so that we see the big picture and we understand how all of these things work to reproduce the situation we're in. I mean, if it were easy to get rid of it, I mean, we're 401 years into this. <laughs> you know, we would have done it a long time ago, but it's hard because it is so complex. And you can't just think, oh, there's a silver bullet. I'm going to focus on this one thing. We're going to solve the problem. No, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, and I think that's a very empowering way to think about it as well because I think a lot of people at Caltech for instance kind of see or might see themselves as kind of very far removed from these issues and kind of 
struggle to figure out what their role is. But I think as long as you can figure out um, how, how, how your role kind of fits into this, this bigger picture, you can kind of empower yourself to actually make changes from the position that you're in, whether you're a scientist or, or yep. what have you. No role is too small. I mean, you know, um, you know, scientists, I mean, this is a debate we have at UCLA all the time. Um, you know, in the, in the college at UCLA, we have five deans. Um, dean of Social Sciences, me, we all have our own divisions that we run. <clears throat> we have a Dean of Physical Sciences, where we have physics and chemistry and all those, those departments. Dean of Life Sciences, um, biology, et cetera, et cetera. We have a Dean of Humanities, and then we have a Dean of Undergraduate Education that focuses on sort of like GE requirements, that type of thing. And all of us talk about the work we can do within our own respective spaces. Um, it's often more obvious in the social sciences because we study this type of stuff, but in the sciences, they're very concerned about mentoring, um, you know, scientists of color or, or, or would be or prospective scientists of color, given what we all know about the statistics, there being so few. Well, why is that? Um, it's certainly nothing intrinsic in the people. It has to do more with the structure. So, that suggests that, you know, as scientists, as professors, we all have a role to play to try to figure out how to grow that pipeline so that we have a society that's more reflective of, you know, who we are in, in, in every area. So, so yeah, I think, I think we all have roles to play. The challenge is just figuring that out. I mean, what is my individual role I can play if I'm really committed to, to seeing a nation that lives up to its ideals? Exactly, exactly. Well, I think we are officially out of time.